that today we're talking about the realm of concept. Um, and we start with the five physical senses, the physical world. Um, very sharp, very clear, very obvious. And yet what we find in our ordinary lives is that often we're completely, we find ourselves disconnected from what's happening physically in the five physical senses uh, because we're lost in the conceptual world of thought and perception. Um, and this is quite normal. And we perhaps don't notice what a weird situation it is. Um, there's flowing through the mind is a river of stories and where these stories have this enormous attraction to us for us so that we get uh, we get drawn into them and it's like the physical world often can't um, hold our attention uh, there's, there's like there's not enough in it to grab us. Whereas the most mundane, repetitive story will grab our attention. And we find ourselves sucked into them and we find them very difficult to abandon. So, it's, so we want to have a look at what's going on in this realm of concept. In, uh, as it manifests in the river of stories. And I think for me that what seems to be central is that, that the stories are attractive, seductive, because they provide meaning. And human beings, uh, as human beings, we really hunger for meaning. And experience has to mean something. Um, and the meanings can be trivial or profound. So something completely trivial, like the thought that pops up in the depths of meditation, coffee now or later. That'll grab my attention. Or uh, the meanings attached to my deepest emotions as they erupt. Uh, so there's a whole range of of meanings from the most the lightest and the most trivial through to the deepest and most profound. But what's really attracting us is meaning. And the meaning comes out of the stories. Um, so thinking is seductive because it's, uh, it's represents the, the, um, the construction of ourselves. Um, who we th deeply think we are and what we deeply think the world is. Uh, when the Buddha is talking about a self, uh, he's, he doesn't refer to, he's not referring simply to me in here. He's talking to me in a world. So every being is at the center of a network of sensitivities, physical and mental. So human beings, we have six sense sensitivities, five of them physical, one non-physical. Uh, and they, the six sensitivities present us with a world. And so if there's a self, there's a world within which that self uh, lives. And if there's a, a world, an experience world, there's a self to whom all this is happening. So the self is, for the Buddha, is always a self within a world. Um, and the concept thinking creates the self. It's one of the major ways in which we create a self. Um, and this is the world as we conceive it to be. And this is oddly what we often refer to as the real world. So I think I've mentioned before in uh, meditation retreats, um, sometimes the question comes up, but what about the real world, eh? What about that? And the context is, is always that a practitioner is deep in their, their practice of meditation. There are things happening 
um, some of them unusual, some of them significant. Um, things are changing, routine perceptions and responses are being questioned. Um, and then out of that comes the response, but what about the real world? How does all this that I'm going through now relate to the real world when I leave the retreat? Now, if you think, if, if you think about what's behind this question, there's the assumption behind it is that this world, the world we're actually experiencing right now, of the six senses, this world is somehow not real. Um, the world that the practitioner is imagining, the world that isn't here except as thought, the world which may or may not turn out to be what they're, we're imagining today, that world is real. So this world, that which we are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching and minding, this world, its reality is uh, shaky and we have to measure its reality against a world that exists only as a concept and may never actually arise in felt experience. And if you think about how many times you've anticipated the future, a future event, and how many times that future event has actually turned out the way you anticipated it, then the odds are that the world which is being imagined will never turn up. And yet somehow that's the real world against which this one has to be measured. So this is a, it's, it's an example of how powerful the world of concept is, um, how it takes over everything. Uh, and we just take for granted that that's, that's the way it is. Um, concept enables us to define ourselves and our world and to create an identity, a functioning identity within it. Uh, so um, we create a sense of a permanent self who survives through time, through story. So I, uh, I define myself in part by my past. And what is my past? It's the stories I tell myself about what happened before. And I plan for the future. And what is the future that I'm planning for? It's the stories that I'm telling myself about an imagined future. So the stories that we tell ourselves give us a stable self that exists through time. And this makes them incredibly attractive and valuable. Um, the self that we're creating, of course, is um, real only as a concept. Um, this comes up nicely with in the work writing of the philosopher Daniel Dennett. I don't know if he's still alive. Um, he must be pretty ancient if he is. Uh, but certainly in his time, he was one of the um, major philosophers of mind in the US. And he wrote a book about, what was it? Consciousness Explained. Very attractive title. But he was talking about the nature of the self. And he came up with statements that are very Buddhist, although he's anything but Buddhist. Um, he says, we do not tell our stories. Our stories tell us. They conjure us into existence. Um, and he, he, he defines the self as the center of narrative gravity. So we're constantly telling stories but there are certain foundational stories that we keep coming back to again and again. This is the center of narrative gravity, and this is the self. Um, so this world of story, the world of concept, in practical terms becomes more real to us than the physical world. And I think this is why thinking, or one reason why thinking is so seductive why it's so easy for a meditator to abandon physical awareness 
in favour of slipping off into some random dream. So this brings us to the whole issue of thinking, particularly in meditation. Um, now, we've, and we've, we've raised this question before, does this mean that thinking is bad and we should stop? We should stop having concepts. Um, this question was addressed in the 13th century by the Japanese Zen teacher Dogen Zenji, he, who wrote a meditation manual, Zazen Shin, the sharp edge of meditation. And he raised it through uh, telling the story of the Chinese teacher Hong Dao of Yao Shan, Hong Dao being one of the great um, Chan ancestors, Zen ancestors. He, uh, the, uh, the story goes, once when great teacher Hong Dao of Yao Shan was sitting, a monk asked him, what are you thinking as you sit so strongly? The teacher replied, I'm thinking, not thinking. How do you think, not thinking, non-thinking? So this is the, the exchange. Um, Dogen pretty much leaves it at that. So you, kind of, you figure it out. Here's, here's, here's all you need to know. But we're going to, we're going to expand on this a bit. Um, so we've got, basically, we've got three things presented to us. Not thinking, uh, thinking, not thinking, and non-thinking. Um, and here, thinking and not thinking are presented as two extremes. So thinking is our normal everyday life where we believe the reality created for us by concept. So the world that concept presents to us, we, we take it to be true. This is it. This is, this is the real world. That's thinking. Not thinking indicates the development of samadhi, of concentration, unification, integration, uh, where the mind goes so deeply into the meditation that thinking is suppressed. It just stops. So this is not thinking. Um, now, uh, some people can do this um, and others can't. But even if we're successful with it, what we've got is a temporary samadhi state and all our delusions and attachments are waiting for us when we come out of that state. So we're back in the world of thinking. So with these two extremes, we, we move from not thinking to thinking and back again. Um, Non-thinking is represents a new relationship to thinking, a different relationship to thinking. And to get a sense of what this is about, let's look once more at why thinking is considered to be a problem in meditation. Um, thinking in meditation is bad only to the extent that it interrupts our flow of attention. So from a practice point of view, this is the problem with thinking. Thinking is bad only to the degree that it interrupts our flow of attention. So the aim of mindfulness practice is to, is to attain a felt continuity of awareness. So awareness remains without interruption on the flow of experience, physical and mental. Thinking is a problem when it interrupts this flow of attention. Um, and instead, what happens is we get sucked into this world of concept and thinking sucks us into this world, uh, the world of concept, and this world can be maintained only because there's a degree of delusion present to sustain it. And if the delusion isn't there, it cannot be sustained. And del the delusion is found in the, the assumption that the conceptual object presented by the mind is in fact the pure phenomenal object. Now, if you, if this is a bit too technical, you don't quite know what I'm talking about, I can put it more simply, it's the assumption that a thought about X is X. 
That's the basic assumption that we have when we enter into the world of concept. And that assumption keeps, makes it real and keeps it going. The assumption that a thought about X is X. And that's a delusion because actually it isn't. In other words, a thought about yesterday is not yesterday. But time has power over us to the degree that we are prepared to believe that our thought about yesterday is yesterday. Um, if a thought arises about yesterday or about anything else, and if we attend to it as simply a thought arising now, then it's not a problem. And it does not interrupt the flow of attention. When we recognize thinking as just thinking, that we are not falling into delusion and we are maintaining an uninterrupted flow of attention on experienced events. And one of the events is thinking. So I'm mindful of thinking. But when we mistake our concepts about what is happening for what is actually happening, that's when we lose the flow of attention. And that's when we find ourselves living in a, in a secondhand world of concepts um, defined by the river of stories rather than the actual immediate lived experience. So it's like we're haunted by our, our thoughts, our stories, our dreams, and we can't get beyond them. So to give you an example, um, let's say I'm minding my own business and then suddenly a memory comes up of a long time ago, many years ago, a memory of a past humiliation or a past trauma. Um, something that happened a long time ago and which greatly affected me at the time. Now, I know this memory is telling me about something which is not present. It's absent. Yet, when the memory arises, my body instantly reacts, instantly responds. So the body cringes to some extent, or I feel tension in the stomach, or I feel heat in the face. So the body reacts instantly. Now, how can this be? Body is radically present. Physical experience is radically present. The body knows nothing about the past. It knows nothing about the future. It's always present. Uh, a, a physical experience always happens in the present. Uh, if I touch something and I feel that touch, when does it happen? It happens now. It doesn't happen in the past. It doesn't happen in the future. It's now. Yet, the body is here responding to something that very clearly and obviously happened in the past. A past which doesn't exist for it. Then why is it the body responds so strongly? Because the mind convinces the body that this event is happening right now. And without that delusion, the body would be unmoved by the memory. So the mind has this power to create an illusion so strong that the body instantly buys into it and believes it. So the problem is not the memory and it's not these physical sensations. The problem is the delusion that convinces me that what is not happening now, what is not phenomenally real is happening now, is phenomenally real. This is the central delusion that comes from the realm of concept. Is this making sense? We hope so. 
Um, so let's look at life in the realm of concept, living in the realm of concept. Um, what is life like here? A concept gives us a world of meaning, like I know what it, this means, and therefore a world of names. Um, now, if you, if you look at the Buddha's analysis of experience, how does experience work? Experience comes through the senses, which are sensitivities to particular kinds of data. So let's take the eye. The eye is sensitive, is the part of the body which is sensitive to light. So the eye what sees visible form. So light and color. And visible form itself has no meaning. But if I'm looking in your direction, I don't just see visible form, I see you. Uh, where the concept you is a name I place on top of what I'm seeing. So there's what I'm actually seeing, and then there's the name I put on top of it. Um, and similarly, the ear just hears sounds. But if I'm listening to my friend speaking to me, I'm not just hearing sound waves striking against the ear. I'm listening to something good or something bad, something useful or something useless, something interesting or something boring. Um, so my mind takes the direct experience and then it creates meaning from it. And it does this through um, putting layers of concept on top of the direct experience. And one uh, term that the Buddha uses to talk about this process is nimitta which can be translated as sign. Nimitta, uh, this word nimitta indicates a label that we add to the immediacy of the experience in order to create meaning. We name the experience to create meaning. We've been playing with this in the meditation when we name what we note. Uh, we do that to create meaning. This is what it is. Um, let's give an example out of, out of meditation, which may, the sort of thing which you may be familiar with. Let's say I am sitting peacefully in meditation with no thought. Has that ever happened? Um, and then suddenly I know that I'm sitting peacefully in meditation with no thought. What happens then? Often what will happen is immediately this experience ceases. Immediately, bang, it's gone. Because I've just placed a name on it to give it meaning. Um, so it's, I name it as, oh, that's good. The practice is working really well. I've created, I've put a name on it and I've created meaning out of it. But in doing so, I've just destroyed it. Um, some of you were talking about this in the this morning in terms of noting the thought stream. Uh, remember the first one we did, stop thinking. And, um, I think somebody commented that, yeah, I, I noticed that the, the thinking, I managed to stop thinking, but then I thought, oh, that's good, I'm doing it. And so I, it's the same process. It's like something happens, but it, it, but it has no significance, no meaning until I name it. So I put a name on top of it. Now it has significance for me. Now it fits somewhere. But of course, in this case, I've just wrecked it. So when I name an experience, I separate myself from it. And I create a duality of me, the practitioner, having this experience over there, which is my meditation experience. Um, and, I, and then I place some kind of value on it. That's a good experience. That's a bad experience. And then it, it takes on a role in my personal narrative. 
and it, its role is to advance the interests of the practitioner. So I suddenly enter into this world of concept through the process of naming the experience. Um, now this process of naming, signing, conceptualizing uh, um, includes language, obviously, uh, but signs and names go deeper than language. Uh, so for example, as I walk about the house, I know where I am going. Have you ever had that experience when you're walking through your house and you know where you're going? Um, but how do you know where you're going? I'm not thinking about it, but still I know. So this is a concept that I'm imposing upon the experience and one that comes much deeper than mere thought. Um, I play, used to play around with this when I was doing my own meditation in a center in Malaysia where I had a, um, this is a fair while ago, uh, they, they give me a monk's hut. And in those days, the, 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 the monk's huts, unlike the lay accommodation, had no electricity because the abbot thought that good Buddhist monks don't need luxuries like electricity. So in order to get a hot drink, I used to uh, take my thermos each after, uh, towards the end of each afternoon, walk down the path to a place where they had hot water on tap, fill up the thermos and walk back. So every afternoon at about the same time, I'd walk down this path, fill up the thermos, walk back again. And one day it occurred to me, uh, and of course I was practicing mindfulness of walking and so on. One day it occurred to me, is it possible for me to walk down this path and not know where I'm going? So I, I practiced this for, uh, for some time and every now and again, it would happen. I'd be walking down this completely familiar path and I wouldn't know where I was going because the concept dropped away. But it didn't last because not long after I noticed, oh, this is what's happening, it would come up again. So it's quite interesting to play around with. Um, what we normally call thinking, quote unquote, is a relatively superficial aspect of the meaning making of the mind. Uh, it, uh, th this making of meaning goes a lot deeper than, than just thought. In fact, we could say that as long as an experience means something, then we're caught up in the world of concept. We're living in that world. Um, the nimitta, the sign, enables us to navigate our experience and make sense out of it. Um, so for example, let's say I'm visiting a friend and my friend lives at 15 Smith Street. So I've never been there before. So I rely on my navigation app to get me there. And my app first finds Smith, Smith Street and then it takes me to number 15. And it tells me oh, you've arrived and I stop the car and I look and sure enough, there is a sign on the fence saying 15. So I've arrived, excellent. Um, so what I do is I get out of the car and I stand in front of that sign that says 15. And I wait for my friend to appear. And although we had an appointment and he's definitely should be here now, there's no sign of him. He's not here. Um, and so I wait with increasing impatience. Where is he? I'm where he said to be. I'm at 15 Smith Street. And there's the 15. And I'm right here. So where is he? Now, meanwhile, my friend, of course, is in the house wondering why I haven't turned up. And if eventually we meet and I berate him for not being there, he'd be quite confused about what the hell I'm talking about 
and if I told him what happened, he would have reasonable have reason to think I was I'd completely lost it, and I was totally mad. Um, because he might point out, especially if he's a Buddhist philosopher, that whatever the sign is, it cannot be my friend's house because it points toward my friend's house. Um, a sign that says X cannot be X because it points toward X. Whatever else it is, it cannot be that because otherwise it wouldn't have its function of pointing toward something. But does that mean that the sign is useless? No, because without the sign, I would be lost. I would never find the house in the first place. But I would be equally lost if I stopped at the sign and became upset because my friend wasn't there. So does this make sense? Signs, signs are useful. Signs are necessary. Like we can't function in the world without them. But if we take the sign to be the reality, if we take the sign to be what the sign points toward, then we are lost in confusion. Then we really don't know what's going on. Uh, and the confusion comes because we take the concept to be what is really going on. Now, from the Buddhist perspective, this is what we do all of the time. Um, we are lost in a world created by concepts because we take the concepts to be real. Um, so again, we use concepts to construct the self. And we need to construct the self. It's not that we can get away with not constructing a self. But if we, if we go through life without constructing a self, we would pretty much need 24-hour care. Um, so the self is necessary. Um, for the Buddha, the self is real, but it's real only as a concept. In other words, I, quote unquote, um, am a useful sign pointing to something. Um, and the problem is that if I try to put into words what that something is, that I is pointing towards, what do I come up with? Another concept. So it's, it's kind of, this is where we get lost in this world. Um, so when Dogen said you, or rather the, um, the, uh, the Chinese teacher, Hong Dao of Yao Shan, when he says, think, uh, in answer to the question, how do you think not thinking? He says, non-thinking. Um, what he's talking about is a relationship to experience in which we don't get caught up in the concepts. In other words, we don't mistake the sign for what the sign is pointing toward. So this is a mind which is not lost in the realm of concepts. I hope this is making sense. If it doesn't, what to do? Uh, Patrick, Patrick yep. is, is it similar then to the map not being the territory? Hmm. It's the same. Okay. okay. But the map is useful, but it isn't the territory. Whatever it is, it's not, the, it can't be the territory. Um, so how do we practice cutting through the realm of concept? Uh, the Buddha speaks about the signless samadhi, the anibhita samadhi. And he also talks about the signless liberation, anibhita vimutti. Now the signless represents the realm not dependent upon concept. 
uh, it's the realm of awakening and of um, of of, of um, the realm of awakening of enlightenment. Now notice that he talks about the signless as both samadhi and liberation. Samadhi means a practice, something that we do, and a liberation is a realization, something that happens to us. So he will look at it firstly in terms of practice. Now we've already actually talked about this in the one-way stream. Uh, remember we talked about noting as the active awareing of the experience the elemental quality of the experience, uh, what uh, Nyanaponika Katera calls bare attention. Um, so uh, a sensation is just a sensation, a thought is just a thought, and so on. An emotion is just an emotion. And this is noting, and this is what we, we practice from, the, from day one. Um, in this maturity, this is the practice that the Buddha explains to Bahia of the bark cloth. He says, uh, then Bahia, this is how you should train. In the scene, there will be just the scene. In the herd, just the herd. In the sensed, just the sensed. In the known, just the known. In this way, you should train yourself. Um, so this is a very famous passage where the Buddha sums up the complete practice in one paragraph. Um, in the seeing, there will be just the seeing, and so on. In the known, just the known. The known here represents the sixth sensitivity, the mind, uh, which we played with today in terms of tracking the thought stream. Um, so, uh, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, or mind is just that is just what it is. It's nothing else. Um, in the tracking the thought stream, we're learning to pay attention to the activity of thinking, the process of thinking, and see it as just an activity, just a process, nothing more. Um, and when we do this, we learn not to take the contents of our thoughts so seriously. Um, and as this practice develops, we become, uh, we become actually more interested in the activity of thinking than what we are thinking about in terms of ordinary everyday thinking. Um, and we begin to recognize the gap between what we think a situation is and what it really is. Um, and again, we go back to the experience of anticipation as an example of this. How often have you anticipated some event or some situation and been excited by it or alarmed by it? And how often does it turn out that the story we tell ourselves about this anticipated event in the future is identical to the actual event when it occurs? In my case, when I've kept account, it's never the same, never. Um, and yet, it's not simply that we anticipate the future in terms of planning for the future, which is very useful, uh, but we become stuck in the conviction that things will turn out as I am, am anticipating them now, um, which is wrong which is a delusion. If we can learn to recognize anticipation is just anticipation, then we can plan for the future without losing our sense of adaptability, uh, without losing a sense of being ready for the unexpected. Uh, because we know as we enter into the event that we really do not know how things will unfold. And so we're ready to pivot as soon as we recognize what is actually happening. But if we take the anticipation to be the future, then we charge into the future and we don't see where our plans are actually completely counterproductive, where they're clearly not working. And, and we, our tendency is to double down and just keep charging ahead because it must be right, because the concept is right. 
the theory is right, so this must be right. So to recognize the concept is just a concept gives us a great deal more maneuverability in the world. So let's look at the signless liberation looked at from the perspective of this. How is the realm beyond concept? But what is that world like? So first of all, the world continues to function as it did before. We are still seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, minding. But so we're in a world of experience, but we are no longer dependent upon a world of named experience, of conceptualized experience. Um, rather, we're in an unnamed experience. Now, an unnamed experience has a particular characteristic to it. It cannot be pinned down as anything at all. So later on, we could look back and we could name it as something. But um, we know that the label has already missed the mark. That there's a gap between the actuality and the name we place upon it. And we can never cross that gap. There's always a gap between the actuality of the experience and the name that we put upon it. Now, this may sound mystical, but it's something that all of us are familiar with. So let's say, for example, that I am an enthusiastic coffee drinker. Let's say that I have a friend who very strangely uh, and very oddly um, drinks tea instead of coffee, which is, you must admit, is kind of incomprehensible. Uh, so in my compassion, I may try to explain to him the unique pleasure that comes from drinking a good cup of coffee and how this is manifestly superior to whatever pleasure you get drinking a cup of tea. Now, no matter how eloquent I am, can I convey this experience to him? And of course I can't. It's impossible. Because no amount of concepts about the experience of drinking a good cup of coffee can ever replace a good cup of coffee. There's a gap between the concept and the real that cannot be bridged. It's always there. And in the sinus liberation, we learn to live in that gap. So this is living in the atnimata, the sign less. Um, it's a world in which names do not apply. So ordinary life goes on. We see, we hear, we think, etc. But we learn to recognize that while our seeing, our hearing, our thinking, and so on are real, they are actually present. What we see, what we hear, what we think, these are not what we take them to be our perceptions and our judgments of what we are sensing are wrong. Now they may be useful. They may even be necessary to get us through the day, but they are fundamentally wrong. Uh, so then we ask, well, what is right? If the concepts are wrong, then what's right? As soon as we reach out to put a label on something, to name it as something, then we are clinging to certainty. And this is what the world of concept gives us. It gives us certainty. I know what this is. Um, and we really value certainty. But when we, the price of that certainty is clinging to a meaning, to a concept. And when we cling, we are stuck and we are in pain. 
But when we recognize that our label does not match the reality, that our concept is wrong, then we can relax. We can relax into uncertainty. Um, and this uncertainty um, stimulates our curiosity. I don't know. So what is it after all? So we become curious. We don't take things for granted. But instead, we are alert to what's unfolding right now. Um, we're present to the actuality of the experience rather than this web of habitual concepts about our present experience. And this attitude is really important in meditation practice, that we learn not to take anything for granted, to not assume that we know what it is, but to look, what is it? Um, when we think we know, we fall into habit. Um, if I think I know what's going on, I don't really need to pay attention anymore. It's like getting into a car and driving down familiar streets. I don't really need to pay attention to the act of driving a car because I already know how to drive a car. So I can drive a car while thinking of something else. So I can pivot my reality into the realm, realm of concept and avoid the activity of driving the car. And I do this because I think I know how to drive a car and I think I know how to get from here to there. Now, of course, in practical terms, I do know how to drive a car and I can get from here to there. But what's happening is I'm operating under autopilot. And what the experience of driving from here to there um, is as it were, I'm separated from it by this web of concept. The mind is dull because it's in the state of habit. I'm just drifting and dreaming. I arrive at my destination and I might realize I have no memory of that, that trip. It might be that I wanted to check whether a certain shop was open or not because I was driving past it. And I, I might realize I've got no idea whether that shop is open or not. I'm not even sure that it's even there. I can't register it even seeing it. So th this is the world of habit. And habit, the world of habit is the world of habitual concept. Um, concept gives us certainty, which is why it's so attractive. Um, but when we fall into uh, when we're certain, we fall back into habit, which mean, means we're asleep. Uh, when we know that we don't know, then we stay alert because I don't know what's going to happen next. If I don't know what's going to happen next, then I pay attention. And then I'm present for the experience. And then the experience has a whole different flavor to it. Um, this is what in the Zen tradition they call beginner's mind, which is used to describe the mature practitioner. As I like to point out to people when we start a retreat, I, I check out to see who's, who's new in the audience, who, who, who has never done a retreat before. And a few people will very tentatively raise their hands and I explain to them, you have an enormous advantage over these other people in this room. And I say, there are people in this room who have been meditating for many years and they are so lost in their delusions that they think they know what's going to happen next. They think they know this will happen on day one, that will happen on day two, and I can expect this to happen on day three. Completely lost. Whereas you, as a beginner, you know you don't know what's going to happen next. This is naive beginner's mind. And I promise them that if they practice diligently and skillfully over a long period of time, one day they will know that they don't know 
what's going to happen next. And this is mature beginner's mind. And this is what in the Zen tradition they greatly value. Uh, and this is the world of the signless liberation, stepping out of the realm of concept. Um, the way the Buddha explains it to Bahia, when there is just the scene in the scene, just the herd in the herd, just the sensed in the sensed, just the known in the known, then you are not by that. When you are not by that, then you are not there. When you are not there, then you are neither here nor beyond nor in between the two. Just this is the end of suffering. I can't put it any clearer than the way Buddha puts it. <laughs> so that's it. Any questions or comments?